Great, so I see we are recording now. So are we ready to start a call? Yeah. Yeah, great. So hello everyone, welcome to the second event of World Series. My name is Joanna. I'm a third year economics with finance student at the University of Edinburgh. And I'm representing Edinburgh Entrepreneur Society as the event coordinator. Personally, I come from Shanghai, China. So it's really my great pleasure to be hosting this event on Asia today. To celebrate diversity of cultures and opportunities within the University of Edinburgh, Edinburgh Business School is collaborating with us, Edinburgh Entrepreneurs Society, to create the World Series. The series of panel events will feature guests uh, representing different regions from all over the globe, and today we'll be focusing on Asia. It is with our great honor and pleasure that we have the four guests with us today. So let me introduce them all. Uh, first one is Bart, representing Tencent Cloud Europe Division. Tencent Cloud is a technology firm started in China. Um, Oli, representing Asia Scotland Institute and also his own startup firm, Asiability. Asiability is a UK advisory firm that is aiming at helping UK firms understand China. And Akmo, a serial entrepreneur from Uzbekistan. Um, he is the founder of the biggest taxi app and food delivery app um, in Uzbekistan. And finally, Dr. Shan from Malaysia. Dr. Shan is the founder of the audit firm Shan & Co. and also the managing director of SC Corporates. Welcome. Um, for today's events, I'd like to divide everything into three parts, um, motivation, journey, and future. So that we'll be learning from you guys from maybe your background, like you're starting up a company or maybe you joined a company um, and to your stories and maybe the challenges you face. And finally, to your insights about Asian companies' future, especially under the threat of COVID-19. And after all these, we'll have some time for the Q&A session where we'll be collecting the questions from our audience. So please feel free to post your questions into the chat box and we'll have some time to go through them at the end of the event. Great, so let's start from the first part now, which is a mixture of background introduction and your motivation. Um, shall we start from Bart, please? Yeah, sure. Yeah, so thank you for joining us, Bart. So we understand that Tencent Cloud is a relatively new startup technology firm from China. Mm -hmm. Would you please introduce us to that? Say how far has it reached in Europe and what do you usually do? And also we are interested in what attracted you to join this firm. Yeah, sure. So Tencent is actually a very big company. They are established in 1998 in Shenzhen in, uh, in China. So it's a very big company, but Tencent Cloud in particular, which is a part of Tencent, is trying to establish itself in Europe. Um, so they're now a few year, uh, years uh, within Europe to uh, try to gain market share. Uh, and I personally joined Tencent one year ago as a strategic sales manager. And I'm based in Amsterdam. I'm from the Netherlands. And I'm responsible for developing the Benelux, Nordics and UK market. So for me, after working for companies like Microsoft and Dell EMC, um, I decided to join a, a Chinese tech company, which I personally think is very interesting because it's very much different than the most of the uh, yeah, American uh, tech firms uh, from a cultural perspective, but also from a business perspective. Um, and Tencent Cloud is, uh, is very much trying to, you know, to penetrate the market, to building up the market in, in Europe. Um, so it's a very exciting uh, time to join because they are growing very fast. And because it is such a big company, um, you actually, we, we have the resources and the finance backing us up here in Europe. So that makes it very interesting to, to, to be part of Tencent Cloud. Um, and Tencent Cloud, uh, we are a bit spread out over Europe. So we have, um, a, you know, my colleagues are based in, in Germany, in Frankfurt, uh, in Paris, in the UK. Uh, but because Tencent is such a big company, uh, I've also colleagues from the from the gaming side uh, based in Amsterdam as well. So although it's it's kind of a startup within a bigger corporation, um, it, you know we have all the resources available, so that makes it uh, very interesting. Yeah, thank you. So actually, speaking of China, we have another guest who's like working with Chinese com Chinese companies. So we have Oli. Uh, can we have Oli now, please? Hi, hi, and thank you very much, Jonah. Um, thank you. Uh, I'm just smiling, um, listening to Bart, because sort of, uh, uh, you know, a startup with very deep pockets, I think. Uh, but, and and uh, uh, I've, done, I've done that as well. I've done a startup with deep pockets, and I've done a startup with no pockets. Um, so, um, but um, 
my uh, my journey uh, I, I sort of spent 20 years as a as an employee working for other organizations Oxford University um, actually a Scottish Chamber Orchestra on, on on Royal Terrace was my first job as a fundraiser and then I worked for Scottish Opera um, ended up working at Oxford University but um, my um, my role at Oxford I was the director of fundraising and, and corporate relations for the side business school and whilst I was there I did as much um, executive education as possible uh, because that was the only way I was going to afford it. Uh, and uh, the last programme I did was a master's in strategy and innovation. Um, and it was on that programme where I concluded, actually, for my generation, it's all about China, um, whether we like it or not, whether you're dealing with fragile states in Africa, whether you're dealing with the economy, whether you're dealing with security concerns, it's all about China. And how, does, how do we integrate China in so many different ways? Um, so that's why I, uh, I founded AsiaBility. But before I did that, I worked for China's leading business school, an organization called Chengdu Sheng Shui Yuan, which is uh, uh, pretty much unheard of in the West. But um, it's alumni in base, um, have controlled a range of companies which uh, equate to about, tw about 20 percent of China's GDP. Uh, so uh, that's my background. So it's nice to meet everyone. Yeah, thank you, Oli. I totally agree with you that it is a generation about China. So, so many countries are looking to work with China, and I believe that Ability is really a great company for UK firms to work with. Like they will be understanding more about China and work with China better. Thank you. Uh, and now we'll move to learn something about Southeast Asia, where we have Dr. Shan representing Malaysia. Dr. Shan, thank you for joining us. Hi. Um, um, yeah. yeah. Please. Okay. Uh, my journey in business started at the age of 11. When I'm looking at all my friends, their parents are pretty rich. And I only realized they're rich because of doing business. That indirectly motivated me to involve in business. So when I uh, graduated from uh, university, I started work with Ern Senior for seven years. Thereafter, I decided I must start my own business. I started my Shannon Group, which is an audit firm. Then from there, we, we do, uh, um, extended the services from audit to uh, corporate recovery, psychiatrical, uh, real estate, um, IT-based business, right? So we now we got uh, plus minus around 20, 23 types of business we are running. And during this uh, particular time, um, I also appointed as a part-time lecturer in the local universities and um, uh, consultant for the Malaysian government on the national budget, right? And um, during um, all this uh, desire came from my childhood uh, because the one thing in my mind is I want to achieve. I want to be rich. The desire created by all my friends and their family. So that's already in plan in my mind. So whenever I do anything, I say, okay, the only way I can develop in business. So I will go full swing. I work, when I started my business, I work, in fact, some of the day I work more than 24 hours. Generally, every day I work 20 hours. First seven years, I work 20 hours every day. Right. Thereafter, I reduce. Once I establish, I reduce my working hour to 12 hours. Now I only work six hours. So I got all the department head, they'll run the show. Right. Um, of course, the challenges um, uh, we, we are still recognized as the SMEs, small and medium sized business. Uh, but that's it. We got now. Um, our wealth equals to plus minus uh, 700 million. So with this is we created within the last 20 years. Mm -hmm. Right? And uh, our policy is we have to take care of our staff. So they are our assets. So as we grow big, we also providing them some percentage of shares. Each of our key personnel, they have 30% shares in each in of our company. So this is how we develop our business for the last 20 years. Yeah, thank you. 
So we're really inspired by your long experiences in your businesses. Thank you for sharing with us. And finally, we would love to learn about ACMO uh, from Uzbekistan. So um, ACMO, thank you for joining us. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, so you started several different firms in Uzbekistan as a serial entrepreneur. So we are interested in what inspired you to become a serial entrepreneur instead of like just starting one firm and managing that. And how did you came up with the idea of starting all these firms? Yeah. Uh, we started back in 2005 uh, with a dream to create a navigation system for Uzbekistan. Uh, then there was no Google Maps, Waze, and other stuff. Uh, and the, there was no uh, iPhones and Android phones. So the, the first idea was to create the uh, like navigation software for Windows mobile phones uh, and the Win Windows CE based navigation systems. And uh, we discovered that we don't have a map of so Uzbekistan, digital maps. And uh, we started the drawing that maps, creating the navigation platform. Then uh, suddenly we uh, felt the competition by Google Maps being Google, uh, not being Google uh, in Uzbekistan, but uh, the free apps uh, made a strong competition to us. And uh, we uh, uh, started thinking how we can use the technology, our maps uh, uh, in other uh, fields. And we uh, started the taxi business, uh, taxi app business. And uh, uh, we started, it, it was two years after Uber started their uh, business. Uh, and uh, we started our my taxi business. And the, the idea, the initial idea was to create a uh, software for taxi companies to manage their fleet, to uh, make a like CRM system for taxi companies. Then we pivoted uh, understanding that this market is very really small and uh, we started focusing uh, B2C customers just uh, like uh, Uber. And uh, that model su succeeded in Uzbekistan. Uh, we were the pioneer uh, here in the market and the market leader. Then uh, we uh, followed the, what Uber did in other markets la by launching uh, food delivery. Uh, we also launched the food delivery. Uh, now our food delivery business is uh, uh, much bigger than our taxi business. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, now we are the number one player in uh, food, deliver, food delivery in Uzbekistan. Uh, so it's uh, uh, like a... a short story uh, about us. Yeah, thank now you. Now we are not only in food delivery, but we are in the grocery delivery. We are in the fast, uh, like a convenience mm -hmm. store on demand business, uh, like delivering um, goods in 15 minutes. Uh, d different, like we are in the delivery field, which is not only food. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for sharing with us. So thank you all for going through the first part with us. And we are really inspired by your motivations and your background. So we would like to learn about maybe something interesting in your experiences. So shall we start from Bart again? Okay. Uh, hello, Bart. Thank you. Yeah. So you joined Tencent Cloud just last year. So yeah. apart from COVID-19, what do you think was the biggest challenge like over this career, this career for you maybe? and maybe something that you learned most from upon joining Tencent Cloud? Yeah, so for me, from a personal perspective, I think joining a Chinese company um, is very different from what I'm used to. Um, so we work with different kinds of internal yeah. tools, but also a lot of the communication is sometimes in Chinese. Um, I'm not familiar with the Chinese language, so that can sometimes be, be complicated. Uh, but that's also challenging. So that's also, uh, you know, you could say that's kind of a, a, a nice thing as well. Um, because I like to, to have a challenge. Um, if you look into the business of Tencent as a whole, uh, Tencent is of course a, an online business. So they have been growing as well uh, a lot over the past uh, months uh, due to COVID because they're very much focused on the gaming industry. So it also brought a lot of new uh, business. Um, I would say a big challenge for Tencent Cloud in particular in Europe uh, has more to do with um, educating the customer. So European customers are very much familiar with, uh, with our comp competitors like uh, AWS, Microsoft, and Google. Uh, but Tencent uh, doesn't uh, directly always ring a bell. 
Um, so they probably have heard from Tencent as a company name, uh, but they're not always familiar with actually all the service and products we're offering. Uh, so Tencent has like a very well established system going on in China. We offer very uh, advanced technology, uh, but it's really, uh, you know, the challenge is really educating those European clients to, to give them a great understanding of what Tencent actually can mean for their organization. Uh, but I'm, I'm confident that over the years that will change and that, uh, you know, the name Tencent will become more and more uh, familiar to most people. Um, and you also see that in, in the list of big, biggest tech companies. So Tencent is within the top 10 and they're going very fast. So I'm confident if that continues that, that it will automatically bring more awareness in the market as well. Yeah, definitely. I think there's uh, still quite a lot of potential for Tencent to grow in Europe and in America, in other continents, uh, rather than Asia. Thank you. So uh, shall we move to Oli now, please? Um, thank you, Oli. So we know that Asiability is still a really young company. It was founded in 2015. So we are interested in if it was really difficult uh, when you first started it, like how did you try to convince the first several UK firms to hire you as their consultant? Yeah, th th thanks very much. Um, I was interested to listen to Bart, you know, the first thing he sort of talked about was the uh, challenge of educating the customer. Uh, and I completely understand, you know, that, I mean, knowing a little bit about China, um, obviously Tencent uh, is, is, is a massive part of the ecosystem there. So it's a bit like sort of saying, well, we need to educate people about Google in the West. It, you know, it's all sort of similar scale. Um, but I think sort of understanding um, what the customer needs to know and the barrier to doing that is, is key. And often the customer doesn't understand that they need the product or the service that you're providing because they're uneducated. And I think that's certainly true in terms of understanding China. Um, people often think that, um, you know, they don't need to understand China or they just accept a very sort of top line understanding. Um, and I'm always sort of um, cognizant of the sort of iceberg model of understanding culture where you sort of see this sort of top, top layer and then you sort of get into a familiarity trap where um, you, you, you think that you understand it just because you see this very top layer rather than actually, you know, there's an awful lot there un underneath. So um, in terms of sort of getting ageability started, um, it was actually quite easy, um, but that was largely because um, I'd spent 20 years working in other organizations and had developed a fantastic network. Um, and over that period of time, I'd built very strong relationships with key people um, who wanted to help me. Um, and one of the reasons why I've got such a strong link with Scotland is because one of the people who I'd worked with um, through the years and had become friends with is a, a Scottish entrepreneur, a guy called Sir Tom Hunter, who's um, Scotland's first billionaire. Um, and actually, Tom was my first client um, as, as Ageability. And then through that, um, having done a good job for, for Tom, um, I got recommended and recommended, recommended. And I was sort of struggling when I was sort of thinking about preparing for this session this morning of could I think of any client that we work with that hasn't come through personal recommendation? And I don't think I can. I don't think we've ever had a single client that hasn't come through personal recommendation. And um, in my previous job, when I was working for Chum Kong Graduate School of Business as their head of Europe, so very similar to... Um, to Bart's experience of working for a massive company in China, but which is little known here. Um, you know, we had deep pockets and we spent a lot of money on marketing and, you know, adverts in the FT and all of that kind of stuff. And again, all of the clients that we generated for CKGSB were through personal networks. Um, and a sort of, you know, reflecting on that, I think, you know, I haven't spent any money on marketing at Asiability at all. I've taken people out for lunch. <laughs> I've made a lot of phone calls. I've worked on doing case studies of clients and I've, you know, um, so I've got, got, you know, good materials. But actually I think one of the mistakes that people make when they're setting up their businesses is that they think they've got to plow a lot of money into marketing and business development. Well, that's a luxury you can afford if you're 10 cent and you're attacking the European market. Uh, but it's not a luxury if you're a sole entrepreneur who's trying to get something going and want to own all of it as you keep growing. Yeah, great. Thank you. So I see like the best way for marketing is actually your network. 
instead of just like a great idea and you want everyone's believing you. So you need to have network, you need to have people recommending you, and then that's your way for success. Yeah, thank you. Um, so can we move to Dr. Shan and hear some more stories about you? Uh, like maybe the, one of the most interesting stories you would like to share with us. Um, like you have multiple responsibilities in different companies and maybe also in universities. So what was the most interesting story you would like to share with us? Um, the interesting story, um, that's a plenty. Um, especially um, um, uh, some, say I'm born as an Indian, although I'm Malaysian, uh, I'm from um, Indian uh, caste. Um, but well, I got quite a number of clients, uh, Chinese clients. Uh, when I started, um, the way I do marketing is different. I always go on success basis. Right, so uh, I will give my proposal to my client. All right, then I say you, and this is my fees. So um, if you um, if you think somebody can give the same services below by uh, my scope, uh, my my fees, you can con continue with them. Other words, you always can come back. So this one way of uh, uh, marketing strategy I use. So to that, I got quite a number of Chinese clients for me. And um, end up um, quite a number of the, my clients, they proposed a daughter to me to become as my girlfriend. <laughs> so that's uh, quite a number of uh, uh, girlfriends. I had an all Chinese girlfriend. But I end up married with Indian girls, right? Uh, that's uh, one thing uh, very interesting from my journey. And um, the other aspect is, um, uh, there are some of my clients uh, recommend me to the government to become a consultant. So they know I'm quite good in uh, mission by uh, taxation. So they recommend me to become as a tax advisor during the budget. So um, uh, that is, uh, it's not under my expectation. So coincidence happened. So um, that also, occurred. then I was with the government for almost 15 years, giving the free consultation. And um, I never expect anything from the government. And um, government, because of my service to them, uh, without any charges, and um, as and when they call, you know, Malaysia, always the meeting is on last minute, as far as government concerned. So they call last minute, we entertain all these things. For that, they appreciate my um, effort. Uh, they have awarded me a, a Dato title, right? And also, they also awarded me a, JP Justice of Peace title for the service I provided to the, uh, the country. Then um, I was also selected by the um, uh, our judiciary as a commissioner. Basically, in overseas we call notary or public. In Malaysia we call uh, commissioner. Work. So they also appointed me, right? All this because of my audit firm, because of the branding we created, Shan and Co. The branding. Right, it's not only purely is a business oriented. We do a lot of CSR program, social responsibility, corporate social responsibility program, whereby uh, we can say almost uh, twenty percent of our business we are going for charity. We do a lot of charity work. That in a way that also is a marketing tool for us, for us to develop quite fast during the seven years uh, because of my marketing strategy on doing social service for. Those are needs. We don't charge them. Give them free, it doesn't matter. So indirectly, they will push us the business. Right? So we have seen this kind of scenario a um, lot. Yeah, thank you for sharing with us. Um, and also, we would love to learn some stories from ACMO. Um, so ACMO, your companies cover a wide range of industries. You have firms like about food delivery, about taxi, about technology. So was it challenging for you to manage all of them at the same time? And what would you say was the biggest challenge? Or what would you say was the most interesting thing that you find? Thank you. 
Uh, currently, uh, we have uh, four companies uh, running, and uh, I am active uh, on two companies. It's uh, my taxi transportation app and uh, Food Delivery Express 24. But all, I'm also shareholder at uh, our uh, B2B businesses. It's a max tech. Uh, it's a GPS fleet management business. And uh, uh, Wortley. Wortley is... Uh, uh, it's a SaaS solution to uh, con control time and attendance uh, and payroll. Uh, we, uh, Wortley operates in, Uzbek, in, in Uzbekistan and uh, in the US. Uh, from US, we, we sell uh, globally. So we have customers uh, uh, in, uh, about using our technology in more than 400 cities around the world. Uh, and the major customers are in Russia. Uh, uh, so, uh, the thing, uh, uh, so I, I have, a, a many CEOs at, uh, Max Rack and, uh, uh, Workly business. So I'm involved with the, like, uh, uh, I, I was, I spend about, uh, two, three hours per month, just talking with, uh, just, just discussing their plans and, uh, just uh, helping them with strategy, but I am uh, fully uh, involved in uh, delivery business because uh, we are launching uh, every uh, month. We are launching in cities, and uh, every city in Uzbekistan is different and uh, has a different mentality uh, and the different different adoption of uh, internet. Uh, so, uh, if, if you talk about Central Asia. The things are a little bit different compared to the developed world uh, in terms of uh, connectivity. Not everyone has a mobile internet, or the price for connectivity is still high uh, for many people. Uh, it, it's the first challenge, and the, another challenge is uh, uh, using just. Uh, ordering something from the mobile phone. Uh, many people uh, not use it to order something because uh, e-commerce is not developed here. And uh, we are trying, uh, the, the, our main job is to educate people to order from their mobile phones. It's the challenging job here. And if we can uh, give them, uh, if they order two or three times, then uh, they, they be, become our customers. So, uh, and we are working a lot and on the logistics optimization. So uh, it's like, uh, uh, we, we are thinking a lot about uh, delivering fast because uh, people, uh, so, so we have to win the, uh, win the like customers uh, from the nearby restaurants, uh, from nearby convenience stores. So uh, the speed of delivery is very important. So I'm uh, mainly involved in delivery business and the transport business and the other businesses are operated uh, and run by uh, the CEOs uh, uh, who are our partners. Yeah, thank you. Um, I totally agree with you. Like the biggest challenge is maybe not to um, start a company um, the biggest challenge is to educate your customers and ask them to choose you to like change their lifestyle. Yeah, thank you. So I think uh, maybe it's time for now for us to move to the last session, which is about future. So we all know that it's been a quite challenging time. Uh, so I would like to bring this question to the panel. How do you think COVID-19 would influence Asia's development? And what is your insights for Asia companies' future, like maybe just in five to 10 years time? Um, I understand that this is really a broad question. So we welcome anything you would like to share with us. So maybe some industries are having a difficult time these days, but some other industries, they are thriving. Um, I mean, um, at this moment, there are challenges, but as well as opportunities. So please just feel free to pop in if you have anything to talk about upon this question. Thank you. Yeah, I can I can start again if you don't mind. Uh, so to, to give you an answer on the first question, how would COVID-19 influence Asia's development? I think it's pretty clear that we see that China managed the situation very well around COVID. Uh, I think other countries could take example out of that. Here in Europe, in the Netherlands uh, in particular, we're going from lockdown into lockdown. 
so you see numbers going up, the lockdown comes and the numbers going down again. So that is very bad for, for businesses and for economy. So I think uh, to answer your first part of the question, uh, yeah, the economy of Asia will recover way faster than the one in Europe. And from a long-term perspective, that could really be, uh, you know, that could really be bad for some certain, some industries and some companies to, to recover. Um, so yeah, and then to answer your second part of the question as well, like what kind of insights um, for Asia and opportunities are there in the near future, five to 10 years? Um, I think that like on a very high, high, high uh, kind of view, high skill, you see that Fortune 500 companies right now are still very much dominated by American companies. There's a lot of American tech companies, but I think we're shifting uh, slowly towards the East. So uh, new, new developments are most likely to come more from China and uh, you will see more uh, Chinese applications and solutions uh, used on a worldwide scale. So for example, you see that now with TikTok, it's, it's a Chinese application, uh, very much used all over the world, uh, but also within our own organization in Tencent, we offer certain solutions uh, which are available worldwide and which many customers are, are using. Um, so I think there's a kind of a shift happening over the upcoming years uh, from, from where we look at into a newest technology. And I think that will be uh, most likely China uh, instead of the US or Europe. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'll, I'll offer a perspective on that, which might be a little bit more controversial. Uh, <laughs> look, um, China's done super well, and, and it's going to continue to do super well. And it's bounced back incredibly well, uh, partly because I think sort of culturally, um, China's much, much more capable uh, at adapting to change. And I'd argue that China's moved forward, sort of leapfrogged five years further down the line through the COVID crisis. Um, it's, um, you know, really adapted um, onto the digital space and it was already getting ahead of us anyway. Um, so I think, you know, huge amounts we can learn from China um, and Asia is going to continue to grow. And that's part, there's just some truths about emerging markets, you know, the, the energy, the, 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 the drive, um, and all the rest. Um, meanwhile, I would argue that the US is largely trying to figure out how to keep um, the world it's created. And it's a completely different dynamic. It's a completely different set of drivers. I think where China's gonna come into um, more problems and we're already seeing this, is sort of China out to the world is gonna get more and more difficult. You know, the US is very clear um, on trying to restrict China in, in many different ways. And I would argue the 10 cent is at the forefront of that. And we've seen sort of issues around that to, to do with Huawei, for example, where Huawei's wings have been clipped about what it can and can't do. So acquisition is going to become difficult. And um, that, I think that, that friction is going to, it's going to increase. But that doesn't mean to say there aren't great things we can do and shouldn't be doing together. Um, there are, there's more things that we should do than we shouldn't do. Um, but um, fundamentally, the next 10 years is going to be quite tough because I think people need to get much, much more um, sort of tuned in to how the world's changing. And I think it's a sort of matter of concern, for example, that there are so few Westerners who can speak Chinese and are taking an interest in Asia and they shouldn't get distracted by the sort of noise and the politics. Um, and they should focus on where the opportunities are being created in the world. And, and a lot of that is in Asia. And, and our challenge in the West is really about how do we um, capture the opportunities created by these huge markets, um, whilst also manage the uh, areas of disagreement uh, effectively. Um, and that and actually influence the things that we want to. So I hope that's helpful. Thank you. Um, anyone else would like to share something? Yeah. Um, uh, the COVID-19 uh, basically is the, um, affected the development of Asia. Um, actually, if you look at Malaysia, um, our development is badly affected. And um, from normally our GDP is around 6%, but last year it came to negative 3%. Right, the same applied to the Singapore and also Indonesia, badly affected. However, um, um, uh, uh, in fact, uh, in Malaysia, we look at the um, uh, SMEs, 
uh, there are plus minus almost 30% of the SMEs close down the business. And official record, they say, number of company closed down is almost 70,000 companies closed down, 15,000 plus factories closed down in Malaysia last one year. All right, that, uh, that, that bad, uh, the COVID-19 has affected uh, Malaysian economy. However, uh, looking forward, um, the recovery period, okay, basically will start somewhere next year for Malaysia, not this year, all right? Um, for next 10 years, uh, Malaysia and Indonesia looks better prospect uh, for the reason uh, more FDIs are going into Indonesia and also Malaysia, right? Um, uh, this is mainly due to uh, the conflict between US and also China. So a lot of uh, uh, Chinese-based company and uh, those are do, they, they are dealing with uh, Europe, they are moving out from China and looking for uh, spaces in Indonesia and Malaysia, Asian countries. So um, uh, in fact, um, currently, currently we, we are receiving quite a number of inquiry from China to transfer the uh, factories to Malaysia. The same applied to uh, Indonesia, whereby Indonesia, in fact, last year they got plus minus 120 billion ringgit investment. Right? So, um, looking forward for next five to 10 years, I think the Asian market will do better. Uh, the economy will booming um, very well um, compared to current. Um, another reason why I'm saying the economy will boom for Asian market is. Um, currently, as I told you just now, there's a 30% of the industry affected. They have closed down the business. So that business will support whoever sustained during this period. Okay, those are sustained during this period. Their uh, turnover and their income will be better for next five to 10 years. So basically, COVID, although uh, for temporary two years, we are badly affected. Thereafter, the recovery period will be better. Okay. And the growth will be much more better. And furthermore, the Asian everything, if we include China and uh, India in Asia Pacific, uh, the population plus minus almost 3.5 billion. So it's a huge market for development. Yeah, thank you. I agree with you that actually after COVID-19, there will be a bigger market for opportunities. Yeah, thank you. So uh, anyone would like to share anything else? Uh, I will add something. Uh, I, will, I, will, I will talk about the Central Asia, what's happening here after the COVID-19. Uh, uh, I mean, delivery business, I know the delivery business is booming everywhere. Uh, mm -hmm. E-commerce is booming here. Ad tech is booming. Uh, everyone is uh, learning online. Uh, uh, schools are online, went online, so EdTech is uh, uh, booming here in, in Central Asia and the health tech is uh, online, uh, like pharmacies, online, uh, the doctor consultancy services like that. Uh, these services are, are booming and what's happening in the region is uh, uh, some major companies uh, from the well, for example, Kazakhstan or Russia entering to the uh, Central Asian markets uh, like uh, Uzbekistan, like uh, Kazakhstan and uh, Kyrgyzstan. Uh, yeah, we have uh, five uh, countries on, in, in the market, including uh, 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 Afghanistan and Turkmenistan, but they are very passive when the when uh, uh, companies from abroad uh, look at the market, they uh, mainly focus on uh, Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, and Kyrgyzstan. So a uh, few international players uh, entered last year to the market. Uh, uh, and uh, this year, uh, more uh, international players are entering to the market and uh, they are speeding up uh, like uh, uh, technology growth here and uh, uh, technology boom uh, in Central Asia. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Um, so, does anyone have anything else to share on this question? 
Or shall we move to the Q&A session maybe? Okay, great. So we've covered all the planned sessions. So we will now move on to the Q&A part. I see there's already a couple of questions in the chat box and we will go through them one by one. Um, so we have a question. What, what advice can you give to young graduates going to work in Asia and for maybe a special case, Taiwan, in terms of the special setting there um, and the business? Yeah, thank you. If anyone would like to share their insights about this question. Um, I'm, I'm happy to give it a shot. I mean, I mean, I think, you know, one of the great joys of working with other people is learning about their culture and learning about how they see things differently. Um, and I think, you know, I'd encourage everyone and anyone to uh, go and um, work for and in other countries. You know, it's one of the most rewarding things you can do and you'll get a better insight. Um, learning the language is absolutely key if you want to understand what's going on. Um, and uh, it's a hard road uh, sometimes, particularly for us lazy English people uh, who, who tend to not bother. But, um, uh, you know, sort of, you know, certainly working for the Chinese organization that I work for, you know, taking the time and trouble to, to, to do your best at learning Chinese, understanding how decisions are made, uh, what the organizational behavior is like, all of that kind of stuff uh, is absolutely key to making it work. Um, and um, so I think, you know, that the language unlocks so much. It's not just about communication. It's also about how people structure thought, about rationality, about values. And, you know, that, that's the big thing I'd ask you to do is, is take the time and trouble uh, to learn the languages that you're working with. Thank you. Uh, anyone else would like to share something on this question specifically? Uh, yeah, sure. We will move to another question. So this question is for Agmo. So Agmo, how do you manage to maintain your presence and influence across different business that you own? Uh, sorry, uh, how I manage... What is your uh, how you manage to maintain your presence? your presence and influence across the art. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, so uh, uh, it, it's not required to, to manage the presence. Uh, and uh, the, 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 the thing is uh, how you create the teams, how uh, motivated team are, and uh, how, uh, like, uh, uh, how you select the team leader or CEO of the company. So uh, you can't be, if you have a multiple businesses, you can't be in all businesses or you can't pay attention uh, like uh, uh, the same way to all uh, businesses at the right time. So uh, you have to focus on one thing. The focus is the most important thing. So. Uh, um, about 85% uh, focus uh, I spent to uh, express 24 hour food delivery business and uh, uh, about 10-15% uh, to the taxi business and other businesses uh, other businesses are managed like uh, we have a sh uh, partners and uh, we meet uh, regularly uh, it's a uh, uh, I meet with CEOs monthly based, but uh, we meet with uh, other shareholders with quarterly based and, and discuss the plans for the next uh, three months. And uh, uh, just, it, it works like this. So uh, daily, daily presence or weekly presence uh, is not required in that businesses. Yeah, thank you. Um, and we have another question. So which industries like specific industry will continue to grow post COVID-19? Uh, so which ones has the greatest potentials? Yeah, I think, I think that, that, oh, sorry, uh, yeah, 10 guys know better. <laughs> yeah, I think you really see kind of a division into the world and like old industries and new industries. I think the companies are focused more on like innovation, technology, 
you know, those kind of things are, are really be the ones who keep growing uh, and who are not that much impacted by, by things such as COVID because they are more agile, more flexible. But the, the kind of old industries, the, the companies who don't uh, manage to, to develop uh, and to, to overcome certain uh, struggles, uh, they are the ones most impacted. So I think there's really kind of a division in the world between now, you know, those old uh, and more, more established businesses and those, and those new companies, which are mostly tech businesses, which are uh, growing still really fast on an exponential rate. So I think that is that is the biggest uh, uh, difference. And just to come back on that first question as well, like for, for graduate kind of what, what experience, um, kind of what advice you would give. Um, I can't answer the question exactly, but I can say I lived in like four different countries and I would say to everyone who, who is graduating or just about to finish their studies, I think it's a great thing to just live for one year abroad in a different environment, uh, in a different culture. Uh, even if you if you don't do it for a career, but more maybe to to learn a language or as an, as an internship or for whatever reason, I think it's something um, very valuable because you you learn to uh, see different cultures, to to live in a different environment, and uh, I think that will always be uh, uh, you know a good experience to to have. So uh, yeah, that would be my answer on on one of those first questions. Thank you, Bart. Um, and Agmo, if there's anything you would like to share um, on the question about opportunities post COVID-19. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, just uh, a lot of articles written about that. And uh, so, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, we can hear you. Yeah. Uh, so uh, again, again, uh, it's a, a whole stack, ad tech, uh, it, and the, uh, depends the region as well. But uh, generally, uh, everything related with tech will grow. Yeah, we definitely agree with that. <laughs> Uh, great, thank you. So we have another question, um, which is asking about what do you think is the biggest difference between Asian and European markets, uh, such as the requirements or consumption concepts, like maybe different clients from different countries, they would like to focus on buying different stuff. So what do you think is the biggest differences? Uh, I can answer to, the, uh, I have some answers to this question. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, 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 the Asian market uh, is now uh, talking about again Central Asia because I don't know uh, well uh, Southeast Asia uh, or Eastern Asia. I'm talking about Central Asia. Uh, the market is less regulated in some fields uh, compared to Europe because uh, Europe uh, is more regulated than Central Asia. So we don't have laws in some uh, fields like uh, uh, on personal data, on uh, other issues. So uh, starting some startups or doing some businesses are easier here because uh, uh, the legal part is not yet uh, 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 followed up the market, you know? Uh, so, uh, and the, it's still like uh, uh, some opportunities for, for example, if you start some fintech startup, start that startups in Europe, uh, it takes time uh, just uh, to follow the all legal issues. But here uh, you have some uh, like opportunities to start now before the uh, legal people come to the field. Uh, so uh, I, the, the first part is the legal part. Uh, another part is uh, uh, the market is less competitive uh, because uh, less players in some fields, no players. And the job of any new player is to educate the market. Uh, uh, and the, by educating, they can have a new customers here. And the, uh, the margins are low compared to Europe, but the customer acquisition cost is also low. 
and some uh, global players come to the market uh, just by the digits, uh, the digits of number of users, uh, not by margins yet, uh, to go to next rounds so when they have to uh, like reach their numbers in terms of users, they come to the market and for, for long period uh, for the Telegram, Uzbekistan was the second biggest market. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so yes, uh, so uh, th these are the, some differences compared to uh, like U U European market and the uh, Uzbekistan market in terms of tech products. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, anyone else would like to share on this question? Um, I I'll offer some um, alternative um, thoughts about this. Um, less about I mean I, I totally agree um, with the comments about regulation and I think that's one of the reasons why we saw you know Britain really stumble with its management of COVID-19 was basically to do with sort of GDPR issues uh, whereas um, obviously in other, in other countries you don't have those kind of uh, considerations in the same way but um, I, I think um, one of the big differences I see um, is the nature of competition in Asia is sort of just intense uh, it's just really intense. And I think people in Europe don't really understand that. They don't understand just how fast uh, change happens and, and is, is adapted, how flexible, particularly Chinese uh, tech companies are, um, and how willing they are to experiment and then abandon things that don't work and then really you know, push uh, things that do work. Um, the adaption of innovation is sort of, you know, intoxicating, I think, in Asia. You just see a energy and you see an experimentation, which I don't think you see um, so much in, in Western markets. And I think that's why, uh, you know, um, we're starting to see a lot more anxiety in the West towards China, because there is a sense of, oh, you know, there's this sort of uh, energy and, um, and, and, and reality to it, which is uh, unstoppable in many ways. Um, so I think sort of one of the best things you can do is get out there and check it out. <laughs> you know, as soon as we can all travel, I'll encourage everyone to get get out to uh, parts of the world that they haven't been to um, and, and, and experience it, because for the vast majority of people, um, they haven't got a clue what's going on. Uh, you know, it's very comfortable in the West, uh, surrounded by our, um, our sort of great institutions and uh, comfortable lifestyle uh, to sort of be lulled into a sense of everything's going to be okay. It's fiercely competitive, and and um, and you've got to get out there, and you and you've got to compete. Um, so uh, that's that's my uh, observation. Yeah, thank you. I totally agree with you. Like in China, we don't use cash anymore. Actually, we are so comfortable with Alipay and WeChat Pay that we just abandon cash at all. And that is really a fast change because 10 years ago, nobody thought that would happen. So yeah, changes happen so fast in Asia, especially in China. Um, anyone else would like to share something on this question? Uh, the differences between Asia and Europe. Yeah. Um, um, see, Asia, one thing, uh, our population is huge. Like compared to, uh, I think, two thirds of the world population is uh, located in Asia. And um, due to that, the price war in Asia is very often and substantial amount compared to Europe. So, um, therefore, the best industry in Asia. Um, for next five years would be consumable item. Consumable item is really the best industry to uh, involve uh, for next five years. Thereafter, maybe it might change. Uh, meanwhile, as far as Malaysia concerned, as I said now, our manufacturing of electric and electronics item is booming. Uh, that industry is good. Apart from that, uh, online industry, whatever online related business, is booming in Asia as of now. Yeah, right. thank you. Um, okay, so I see we are already exceeding one hour. So thank you all for joining us. We've heard awesome stories from you. 
Um, so I think this is a wrap for the event today. Thank you again to our panelists. Thank you for joining us. And also thank you to all of our audience for joining us. Thank you very much and see you. Thank you, have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.